Good afternoon, everybody, or if you're in some other region, good morning or good evening. Thrilled to have you here in this afternoon session for the Africa Business Forum here at Oxford Said. And I am particularly thrilled to be with Acha Leke, who I've known for what, Acha, you know, six, seven years at least. Um, quite, quite a few years indeed. Quite a few. Um, and uh, who I think extraordinarily highly of, but you'll hear about that in a second. So for those of you who don't know Ache and who haven't read his bio, he's senior partner at McKinsey's Joburg office. He's chairman of the firm's African practice. He's a member of the, of the shareholder council, which is the top council at McKinsey. He's been at McKinsey by my calculation for about 23 years since he was a student. Um, and if you wanna read about all his McKinsey accomplishments, you can go on the McKinsey webpage, including a great interview with him about how he stumbled into a a job fair where he uh, met a McKinsey recruiter. Um, in addition to everything else uh, that, that he does, he's engaged with, with the African Leadership Academy and co-founder of that, as well as African Leadership Network. Um, as a student, he was an accomplished student at Georgia Tech as an engineer and then went on to earn two masters in engineering and a PhD at Stanford. Um, and he's been received all kinds of awards and honors. Um, and he's written this outstanding book uh, called Africa's Business Revolution, How to Succeed in the World's Next Big Growth Market um, in 2018. Um, one of the pleasures that I have in doing these interviews is going back and reading, you know, or watching, depending on who the guest is. And I've done a lot of reading and watching of Acha over the years. And this morning I went back and I, I'd read the book years ago when he gave it to me. Um, and I read his stuff since then. So we're going to key off of that because I really do think that the book, and I'm not just saying this because I'm interviewing, is the single best book on Africa that I've read in the last 10 years. Oh, so, you. Uh, but, you know, it was written in 2018, um, before, well, before the world that we've experienced in the last three mm -hmm. years. You were extremely bullish about Africa in 2018, in a qualified way, and we'll get through those qualifications in a bit. Still bullish, and why? Um, first, thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. And it's always a pleasure to, uh, to engage with you. Uh, I, I am an eternal optimist, and I strongly believe in the continent even more so now. Uh, we do have our challenges, which I'm sure we're going to get to. Um, but, you know, I'm bullish because at the end of the day, if you, if you just consider the fundamentals of, our, you know, of, of the continent, they're still very strong, right? We still have, you know, the youngest population in the world, right? The average African is 19, as you know. Um, you know, we are, you know, we are 1.3 billion people, a sixth of the world today it will be two and a half billion by 2050, a quarter of the world. We could be up to 4 billion as per the UN estimates by the end of the century, a third of the world, right? So imagine a continent that's home to, call it a quarter of the world's population, right? Two is, you know, it's urbanizing, right? As you know, you know, every year, 24 million Africans move from from rural regions to the urban regions where the urban African tends to be more productive than a rural African, right? And it's easier to provide access to all kinds of services in urbanized regions, right? So, and that train again is, is gonna continue. So that's another trend there. Thirdly is, you know, there's, there's a lot of need on the continent, right? We need a lot, right? And so when it comes to business opportunities, there are a number of challenges. We just look at the fundamentals, the fundamentals, you know, are quite solid. And that's why I'm bullish. Great. Um, we'll get to some of those details and some of the limitations as well. When you were writing the original book, I want to just quote something. You said you were surprised that companies that do well in Africa were the companies that addressed a fundamental societal need. And you were surprised about that. I guess as a McKinsey consultant, a McKinsey partner, and a head of, you know, part of the governance committee, why are you surprised that that characterizes Africa? Does that not characterize other parts of the world? Or is it special about Africa? What is it about addressing a fundamental societal need that, that seems to be correlated with success yeah. in Africa? Well, what we meant by that, and you can see it, you know, sort of when you start to think about what it takes to win, is as we research, I researched many, many companies, right, to understand what it took to not just, you know, build a successful business, but also, you know, build a sustainable business for the country. Because we've seen enough, we've seen quite a few people come in, you know, uh, be successful for a few years and had to leave. And we realized there are a number of things they do right, but at the center of it all, it's sort of the mindset at the ethos with which they approach the continent. They approach it with an ethos of saying, we need to make money, I wanna make money because we need to you know, do that for our shareholders. And that's actually the right thing to do, right? As a business, right? But that's not the only reason we're here. We're also here because we wanna make a difference, right? We wanna 
uh, provide um, uh, affordable consumer products to those you know who need it and provide electricity right to those who need we want to provide some banking services to people who've never gotten it before healthcare services and if you have that mindset just because there are a lot of challenges as you know you're going to face throughout your time trying to do business as a content with that mindset at the bigger picture in mind it helps you overcome these challenges right so that's why we realized the big companies that did well are those that you talk about do good and do well at the same time and that's really the ethos it takes to build a successful business across the continent but why is that a surprise and does that not well, characterize no, businesses in other places too well it, it may be in other places but we came at it from a perspective of we thought the ones that did well are people who had the right business model and you know who did the right innovations and only only came at it with the business side of things right yeah. not not with the mindset of actually making a difference so that was that's a bit of a switch you know Everybody wants to make money, and that's clear, and that's fine, right? But at least in Africa, we realize, and it may be relevant in other in other parts, maybe in other emerging markets. What we realize is, if you really separate the winners from the losers, those who have this this different mindset of combining making money with making a difference, are those are the that was successful. Needless to say, this is why you and I are simpatico about this. This is great, um, but you know, let's kind of go from the kind of where we were up at some high level back down to the ground. And on the ground in the last year, um, we've experienced COVID. Um, you wrote, and I've got one of your reports here about tackling COVID-19. Uh, you wrote this in April, 2020. You mm. laid out a game plan for what private sector had to do, and what government had to do. Um, how well has that game plan been implemented? And then after that, we'll talk about what's the implication of that? Where are we yeah. now with respect to COVID? But let's talk about the game plan. You yeah. laid out a five-step plan for government and a four-step plan for, for the private sector. Yeah. What's happened? To be, to be fair, I think it's actually been fairly well implemented. If you look at, you know, at the time we were actually very concerned, right? So we did a number of projections that you probably saw in the report that we thought yeah. when we projected sort of GDP across the continent, we thought at best it'd be flat we thought you know it could contract by as much as five percent we eventually contracted by about two and a half two point six percent as a continent right we also looked at jobs losses and we thought you know we could actually potentially see up to a third of jobs could be at risk on the continent right which is about 30 million formal jobs and up to 100 million informal jobs the reality is we've lost we've lost jobs we've lost 30 million full-time equivalents right so less than what we had projected so in some ways and it's because you know, one is we reacted very quickly. So I think governments, back to the game plan, many governments reacted very, very quickly to the crisis. Also because what we saw, we saw it coming from afar, right? So we could actually be better prepared. You know, we seen, we saw a lot more collaboration between the public and the private sector. Uh, but also part of it was, you know, we realized we could not just shut down our economies for too long because a lot of people, you know, if they didn't work, they couldn't, they wouldn't earn a living. They wouldn't be able to eat that day. So we were not able to, to, to lock down our economies. And as a result, I think we did a, a probably a better balance between the health and the economic crisis than some other regions of the world, right? We still had a number of issues, but if you look at number of cases, number of deaths, right? And so some companies actually did did quite well. And so I think I think you know it was actually quite well executed. There are a number of things as, as always that we could have done much better. But as a result, you know, the worst case many of us were fearing in April didn't come to, to light of day, right? And, and the country was able to fare much, much better throughout the crisis. And obviously Africa is a complicated continent, 54 countries, lots of different sectors. Did any countries or sectors stand out have, have, as having done a better job in addressing the issues around COVID? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we look at it, for us, COVID is actually an accelerator. This is around the world, not just in Africa. Mm -hmm. What we found were countries and sectors and companies on this that were doing better pre-COVID actually did much better than the competitors during a post crisis. And those that were doing worse, you know, did even worse, right? And so it's more of an accelerator. Now, you know, the winners clearly are those who were able to pivot very, very quickly, right? So we look, we've, we've done a lot of analysis across sectors, right? If you look at some of the sectors that were least affected, telecoms, for example, um, you know, e-commerce, retail, actually the payments, for example, actually accelerated through the crisis, right? And then you have some sectors that were, you know, uh, uh, hugely affected, right? And not just because we talk about COVID, but it was a global crisis, it was a local crisis, it was an oil crisis. So all three hit us at the same time. And so sectors like the oil and gas sector or the hospitality sector, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, were actually quite affected. Um, uh, um, and but even within those sectors, there are always companies that are winners, right? And what we call them the resilience. And these are companies 
And what you realize, we've done a lot of analysis to show that companies that typically win during crisis create a much bigger strategic distance between them and the competitors post the crisis. And so the decisions you make, as you know that better than I do probably now during this crisis are fundamental because it sets you up for both the crisis. And we've seen a number of winners across sectors, right? Um, so that's on the, on, the, on the sector part. On the country front, again, you know, typically countries that were better, you know, I was in Rwanda last week, you know, hugely impressed by, you know, what they did and how strict, you know, lockdown even to last week, right? Um, you know, they still have, you know, curfew starting at 9 p.m., right? And everybody wears a mask. And, you know, and the very strict guideline, typical Rwanda. But you can see that, you know, they, they, had a, they had a tough year last year, right? You know, G, G, uh, growth, growth dropped from sort of 9% the year before to minus 3% because of tourism. But you can see it started to pick up again, right? Uh, you look at what countries like Togo did very quickly. Um, they didn't have really have much of a social safety net program, but literally in a matter of weeks, they actually put one in place, right? To help protect the most vulnerable, all digitally called Novisi, which was interesting, they actually were giving money every two weeks to different families. They would give a bit, they would give more to women than to men, by the way. And it was all done digitally, right? Which worked incredibly well and trying to figure out how to expand it. And so you see so many of these type of examples of, com of countries, of governments that really uh, uh, were quite innovative very quickly to help to help fight the crisis. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, some of what you just said follows exactly off the research that's been done for years and years about how to make make things happen. For example, the last point that you made about giving money to women um, and, you know, regular regular funds. Uh, you know, there's been research to show that for a long time, and it's great to see that it's been done exactly. kind of on the ground in real time in an important time here in Africa. So we're supposed to talk about growth. So maybe we should talk about growth. Um, and, but again, I, I can't help but go back to 20 or 2018 work mm -hmm. and then the kind of the summaries of it that you have in the various other periodicals. And in it, I think you identify three sectors that are big growth sectors for the continent. One's tech, one's basic services, and one's infrastructure. So let's take them one at a time. So in terms of tech, um, yesterday we had not only the first day of this conference, but we also had a round table on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ecosystems in Africa. So as you think about that, and that was, I think, 38% of people thought that that was the top sector that you're going to see growth mm -hmm. on the continent. It was 38, 37, 37. Those three were kind of at the top of your list. So what's it going to take for the tech sector to succeed in Africa? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not Africa, all of Africa. I'm sure that there's... Mm -hmm you know, ecosystems in, in Nigeria and other places. And so if that's the top sector for growth that you saw in 2018, is still the top sector? And if so, what are the kind of uh, actions that governments can take, that investors can take, that uh, um, universities, whoever? So who can help accelerate the growth of the tech sector in Africa? Yeah, I mean, I think it's even more so now, right? I mean, one of the biggest trends, we looked at all the trends coming out of the crisis. And by far the biggest was acceleration of Africa's digital transformation. It was happening, and that's where you sort of so we saw that already in 2018. But through the crisis, it's just accelerating, right? And uh, you know, a lot of things that still need to be done. But right? you can see huge opportunities, and that's where you see a lot of money already, investor money flowing into that sector. It's funny, I just came from lunch with Richard Okello, um, uh, who founded Sango Capital, right? Funds of funds, and they're also doing. Uh, direct investments, right? And that's the space is looking at very, very closely. So we've seen a lot of money. We see, we saw the pay stack deals. We saw Flutterway. We're continuing mm -hmm. to see, you know, every single company, Airtel, carving out the mobile money business in Nigeria. Sort of every single bank is looking to carve out uh, uh, those businesses. Um, so I think there's there's a lot going on there. Now, what needs to happen? Um, first is, you know, we we need we, we need this to be these companies to be successful, right? So we're very excited about what you see on the money flowing in, but you know, success is a great success. So again, for me, it's very important across all the different sectors that they actually be, that, that we, we put in place, we help these companies succeed. So I think that's one. Um, two is governments need to find a way to embrace it, right? And I think you find, again, much more advanced governments who, you know, complete and put in place their regulatory environment to allow it to thrive, right? Electronic signatures. In some countries today, you still can't, you know, that's still not recognized, right? So there are a number of regulatory things that need to be in place from an, from an enabling environment perspective for it for, for for it to thrive. I think you know these you know these part of the, the advantage of such a sector is that it's easy to scale, right? So if you have a tech business digitizing the health the health sector in Nigeria and already across six countries, 
you know, quite quite easy to scale. So how do we help them scale even faster, right? And that's where um, 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 entities like the Africa Continental Free Trade Area can actually help, right? How do we harmonize regulations across the continent? Like you said, it's 54 countries, right? How do you harmonize regulations and allow them to scale to scale very quickly? Then there's everything around just you know management of, of, of the company, right? How do you build the tech skills in the continent for that, right? And this is why I think there's another huge opportunity. We always talked about Africa bringing the bed basket for the world. Now that people are very comfortable with working from home, working remotely, even more so to the crisis, I'm like, can we be the outsourcing basket of the world, right? And it doesn't have to be, you know, call centers, but it could be data analysts. It could be a number of different, uh, where we, but, but we have to build the skills here so we can provide it for the rest of the world, right? A data analyst in, on the continent, you know, you probably pay them fifteen, twenty thousand dollars at max per year. In the U.S., it costs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? So how do you get some of the U.S. companies to think through, you know, how do I then? You know, and there were some companies in Africa that were looking to do that. But I think this whole space has so many opportunities, right? So focusing on investors coming in and providing the capital needed, governments putting in place the regulatory environment that's necessary for it to thrive, and then entrepreneurs making sure they have the skills, right? And, and building the skills internally to get it to thrive. And I, can, I think this could be, you know, the, be the next big thing coming out of the continent. Mm -hmm. So let's stick with that for a moment before we get to the other sectors. One of the other things you've noted in your book and your other things is the disparity between how people inside Africa and outside Africa evaluate opportunities. Just even as simply as what countries are the areas of most growth as opposed to what industries. So, you know, what do you see that we can do or that we need to do in order to align investors outside? Because I think from what I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, inside investors, people inside Africa, they can see these opportunities. Mm. People who are outside of Africa, less so. So, is this a problem to be solved? Should we just let it be the way it is so that people who are knowledgeable you know, kind of put their money where it's supposed to be? Do we want to kind of improve how non-Africans think about Africa so that more money flows in? How do we think about that? So because I, I always say it depends who you ask. Right? I remember some of my clients in the continent who are doing incredibly well are saying, Acha, we'd rather you not go continue to tell this positive Africa story let people out there think it's too dangerous and they'll stay out. We will stay here and continue to do incredibly well, right? So that's one school of thought. There's another one which says, you know, I think we need to close this perception gap between, you know, between the, the perception of risk and the reality of risk on the continent. And there is a big gap there, right? I think it's starting to close, right? But the reality, the way it closes by people understanding the continent better. So it's not sitting in Tokyo or New York or Dubai or Singapore looking at some numbers, right? is actually coming and experiencing the continent and trying to understand what's happening, right? And we found that those who do that, then start, then you can start to differentiate because again, it's 54 countries, right? And mm -hmm. you'll always have, you'll always have a crisis somewhere. Remember one of my oil and gas clients and they're in 30 countries around, around Africa. And the one, the CEO told me once, look, every year five are gonna blow up, honestly. We don't know which ones, right? But we know five are gonna blow up, but the other 25 are gonna do well. And for 40 years, they've done incredibly well on the continent. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's really understanding this diversification of your risk, uh, but also just having a much more granular understanding of the continent. That's what's needed. Now, as part of that, um, I think it's, you know, what are we, you know, we try to do that a bit um, when President Obama set up the President's Advisory Council on doing business in Africa, is how do you get some of the, the idea was to get some of the SMEs in the U.S. to actually come spend time here, tour the continent, understand figure out where the opportunities are. That's part of what we publish as McKinsey, right? You know, we do it because we think it's the right thing to do to make sure people have a fact-based perspective of what's happening on the continent. And then they can make a decision. Isn't that that least to have a fact-based versus more of an emotional-based perspective of what's happening on the continent. But I do think that it is, it is starting to close, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for us to close that gap. And in fact, you and I are both trying to do that. I'm trying to do that at school by having lots of Africans. We have more than 12% of our class from Africa, mm -hmm. and I, I got well to believe- Well done, I remember you spoke about that and that your target was 10, so well done to get it to 12. I know. Yeah, so we've we've hit more than 10 for each of the last, I think, five or six years, and I'm really proud of that. But as, as much as that's been transformational for the students, I'd like to think it's the 88% of non-Africans who have a much better appreciation for the continent than mm. they would if, quite honestly, they'd never actually spent much time with our African students who are simply amazing. Well, Absolutely. the first the first sector, in fact, was tax. Second was basic services, which is education and healthcare. And we could spend time on, you know, what's the impact of COVID on healthcare and healthcare systems 
in Africa. But let me jump to the third, it's infrastructure. The third sector, which was almost tied neck to neck with uh, tech, was, uh, was really infrastructure. But your colleague has written, I'm trying to remember which colleague, I've got it here, uh, kind of this interesting paper just a few months ago about why it is that there's this paradox in infrastructure um, that mm. Africa has lots of opportunities, there's money flowing, but yet somehow infrastructures, yeah. you know, it's not working in Africa yeah. in terms of the money's not getting to the projects. He, the team has identified a number of things. Could you kind of give us a sense of why is it that infrastructure is such a big opportunity? I think that's a simple story. Why is it such a paradox? And that's a more yeah. complex story. Yeah, it's not a straightforward one, right? You know, the positive story is, you know, 15 years ago, we were investing $40 billion a year on infrastructure. You know, um, a few years ago, it was up to 80 billion. But in 2018, for the first time, we had commitments of over 100 billion in project funding. Um, you know, the AFDB has done the work. We've done some math to say to close the gap, we need about $150 billion investments every year, right? So we're still not where we need to be. Um, but you know, so 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 you know, so we need the infrastructure. It's very clear. There's plenty of money out there. There's no question about it, right? But the question, you know, how do you then match <laughs> that money with the actual with the proper need? And there are a number of challenges, right? One is unable to, to tell you about that. It's the lack of bankable projects, right? So first of all, you know, there's some infrastructure that honestly you'll never make money on, and that governments, you know, you know, philanthropic organizations have to help put, you know, have to help fill that gap, right? But there are plenty of asset classes where you can actually make money, right? Power is one of them. You know, the telecom infrastructure is another one of them. Certain elements of roads is one of them. And so the question is, how do you then make sure you, you bring the project to the point where somebody can recognize and say, hmm, interesting project, and put money in it, right? And hence, you see, you know, a number of institutions like Africa 50 being set up uh, to focus on actually bringing, you know, helping early stage projects, bring them to bankability, where you see private sector investors willing to invest in them, right? So that's part of the challenge. And we need more, more focus and even more institutions going mm -hmm. in and creating these projects, right? So that's one. Two is, you know, infrastructure is, 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 you know, inherently linked with government, right? And so there's always, you know, challenges around if you want to do a TPP with governments in Nigeria at the time, it used to take seven years to do a TPP. I believe it's probably changed now, right? It used to take way too long to get that done, right? In seven years, a lot can change. And then the government changes, you have to start with some new, you know, remember, when the, uh, uh, um, they were trying to build Azura, right? Uh, David and, 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 and Philip and, and the team at Amaya Capital. It took a long time as an IPP in Nigeria to actually get it over the line, right? And it took blood, sweat and tears. So I think, you know, the, the transaction costs to get these projects over the line in Africa are just way too high, right? So the question is, how do we um, uh, uh, shorten that time frame and just make it easier for these projects um, uh, to take off? Third, you know, the number of, if you look at just power, the big issue around cost effective tariffs, you know, governments, you know, don't want it to cost too much to mm -hmm. the consumer, but then, you know, private sector investors need a certain element of, you know, the price to be, you know, at a decent level for them to actually make the returns, right? And then you get stuck in those negotiations with government. So I, I think those are all the challenges, right? The good news is technology is helping a lot, right? So I see in the past, you've had to you know, to, to you know, take power to a village, you have to draw lines all the way to that village. You never make money on it. But these days, through the whole of solar home systems, you see what happened across East Africa, what's happening across West Africa. You can actually find a viable business model for the private sector, right, to bring to bring that power. So I think technology is helping. I think you're seeing a lot more um, uh, uh, development partners, you know, stepping up and playing a role. You're seeing more private sector people coming, players coming in. You see governments understand that we cannot continue to take seven years. Right, so what do we need to do to accelerate some, some of these projects? So all of that is coming together, but you know, we still know where we need to be. And I still think it's gonna take quite a while for us to get there, unfortunately. Yeah. Let's, we're, gonna, we're getting some audience questions in. Let's move over to talk about people a little bit. Um, and let me just do this question first. Uh, question from the audience. Lions on the Move was one of the most widely read McKinsey reports. Did the lions arrive and where do they go to next? <laughs> well, that's a good one. I didn't ask that one. Uh, so first is we are launching the process to write the third one, right? So we had Lions on the Move in 2010. We then had Lions on the Move 2 in, um, in about 2015, 2016. So we've launched the process now. And I think it's a very good one. The Lions clearly have not arrived. But let's be clear, they haven't arrived, right? Um, I think they're still a bit too slow for my liking personally, right? And, and it's funny because I was looking, I was looking at the numbers. So when we did 2010 Lions on the Move, the continent through that first 
decade of growth, 2000-2010, grew the entire continent 5.4%. It was the fastest growing region in the world, right? Mm -hmm. or the second fastest growing region. Between 10 and 2015, so we wrote like the second one in 2016, so we sort of covered 2010 to 2015. Growth had slowed down. There was still 3.4% across the continent, and we're now the third fastest growing region in the world, right? Between 2015 and 2019, before the crisis, we talked about the crisis, before the crisis, we had gone down to 1.2% growth across the continent, right? We're only the sixth fastest growing region in the world. Our two largest economy, Nigeria and South Africa, had gone through a recession, which is part of the problem, right? And so even before the crisis, you know, the continent was actually struggling already, right? And the fundamental question we have, and I don't have the answer, but, and that's what we're looking for, I'd love to hear, you know, your views, by the way, Tito, great to hear your views, maybe. It's to say, we talk about Africa, you know, so, so I think we would all love sort of a China story. How can we sustain, even if it's a slower growth, call it 4% a year for 30 years across the continent, right? Across 54 countries on average. And, you know, we're having a question, can we do that? Or is it because it's Africa, it's 54 countries, you'll never be able to get there, right? you always have some pulling us down. Is Africa the right axis to look at these things? Or do we, do we need to look at more regionally, differently? How do you cut it, right? Because the reality is 54 countries, there'll always be challenges here and there, right? And so, the big question we have is, you know, this idea, we always have Africa rising and then they stop rising, then it starts rising again and then it stops. And our question is, you know, is that the right angle to come at it or should we look at it fundamentally differently? I don't have the answer, but that's what we'll hope to answer in the next, in the next report. What Fair. do you think? So I, you know, I tend to look at, you know, well, the advantage of being an academic as opposed to an investor is an investor has to worry about short-term returns. I worry about, you know, basically 25, 50 year horizons. Um, and I still think that over 25 or 50 year horizons, absolutely, it's it's the right place to go because of the demographics, because of the rise in consumer spending, uh, kind of a consumer middle class, because of the diversification of the economies away from agriculture and natural resources. There's a whole lot of growth in there. Um, but, you know, that's why I bet, bet the school that would have bet it. But, you know, let, let's pick up this point about, you know, Africa versus 54 countries. Um, one of the early times that you and I met, you were at the, one of the global, we were both at one of the global agenda councils at the WEF. Yours was working mm -hmm. on kind of making it easier to travel across Africa. And kind of a, and that that I remember was celebrated that, you know, a number of visa rules were simplified. But, you know, the, the bigger version of that is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can explain to the, you know, the listeners what, you know, that's all about. First of all, just defining that. How hopeful are you that that is going to turn Africa into more of, well, certainly it's still going to be a combination of countries, mm. but more of an integrated economic region? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so AFCFT, we are most obvious 54 countries, we talk about 1.3 billion people, but, you know, just a simple thing, COVID vaccines, right? So, you know, to register, if, you know, you want to get the registered Pfizer vaccine, Malawi has to go through its own process to register, I have a lot of that takes, and could device to go through its own process. And more or less go to its own process. And uh, the question is, you know, why don't we have just one continental body that registers it that everybody trusts and they can apply it across the continent? So having one one body, you know, one continent as in one economic zone that sort of has the same rules, right? Duties across. So if you uh, you know, if your your truck leaves from Lagos driving to Dakar, you don't have to pay duties across, right? Um, so that's a bit the idea is let us have one one big economic zone across the country and that will make us again much more powerful as we negotiate with whether it's the US, China, any of our partners, right? That's the idea. Now to get there, the number of things you need to do first, you need the countries to come and say, is the right thing, let me sign up to do this, right? And that, you know, took a long time to get there, but under President uh, Kagame's leadership at the AU, he had decided that this is what this is what he's gonna make happen. And while he was chair of the AU, you know, this was ratified, right? And so Countries agreed we need to do it. And then we went through a process of getting it signed. The good news is 54 countries have signed it, right? Now, it was a very difficult process to get there, but I think that's the easy part of the job, right? So now it's signed, but the question is how do you then implement it and make it happen in reality? And so they set up in, uh, in Ghana on, 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 on how, what the private sector, how to really uh, uh, make this work for the private sector, what, 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 how can the private sector also, uh, also support that? The challenge there is, um, the question is, how do you get started, right? So there are a number of issues, everything from visas, right? To your point, when we started this work seven years ago, um, an African on average needed visas for 60% of African countries. And what passport do you hold? US. US. An American needed visas for 42% of African countries. 
a European for 55%. So it's easier for you to travel across the continent than for me with my Cameroonian passport, right? And there are only five countries that allow any African to just show up and get a visa. Either you need a visa or you just get on arrival, right? So we've done a lot of, you know, advocacy and all that. Long story short, today there are 27 countries out of Africa where any African can either show up and get a visa on arrival or uh, they don't need a visa to get it, right? And there are many now, right? So we're making progress, we're not where we need to be. But those are the kind of things, you know, I talked about, you know, regulation of, uh, of pharmaceuticals or even vaccines, right? How do you harmonize these regulations? How do you harmonize them? So that's one, I think those are some of the easier things to do. So you harmonize and then all the countries apply it, right? The harder things to do are things around, you know, tariffs. How do you make sure that you apply, you decide, you know, no tariffs across all of these borders. And then when a truck leaves, they make sure they go through the borders without paying, without paying tariffs. How do you make it easier for, com for companies uh, to scale? So it's critically important, again, as we said, to real to, to scale continent and grow our intra Africa trade, which today only sits at about 16%, and to grow that, right? Um, we're starting, I think the, we started the process. Now the secretaries are up and running, they're getting going. But the question is, how do you actually create quick momentum so people don't see this as yet another institution that was created by the AU that's not delivering, but people get excited about it, mm -hmm. and then that generates even more momentum to continue? Well, we have about 10 minutes and I've got a flurry of questions from the audience. So let me try to kind of do some of these because I've got a whole list of mine, but you know, our students are far smarter than I am. So let me let me try some of their questions. Um, I'm gonna put two of them together. Given the demographic advantage observed in Africa, what are the most significant near-term opportunities you think need to be focused on over the next decade? And then I'll add a second one. Um, we think of Africa as a homogeneous entity um, how can the continent best compete with global economies like China and India? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think on the demographics, for me, it's very clear. You know, if you're a consumer-facing country, right, so you deal with the end consumer, you, you just can't avoid Africa. I just don't understand how, you know, this is going to be the, you know, home to a quarter of the world, right? You call it, whether it's 30 years from now, 40 years from now, you can't avoid it. Um, and so, again, you know, how do you decide where do you go, where should you, yes, it's Africa, but where should you um, uh, uh, set up shop? You know, take Nigeria, you've probably heard this already, right? There are more babies born in Nigeria every year than the whole of Western Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a baby foods company or a diapers company, where is your growth gonna come from? Well, it's not the easiest place to do business, right? But if you do it well, you can actually, you know, again, do very well, you know, for your shareholders, right? So again, I think from a demographics perspective, there's no question about it. There is a risk associated with that, though, because yes, we're excited about the demographics, but we need to make sure that you know our people are educated, right? And that's part of the challenge. We didn't talk about that much, but we need to make sure they're educated and that either they can get a job or they actually you know create a job for themselves and be entrepreneurs and create jobs for others, right? We're not you know doing quite too too well on that front. So a lot of the focus, as you mentioned, that I have outside of McKenzie is exactly in this space. But there's something to be done there. Um, now, in the question about how to compete with China and the others, that's what I really think. Um, uh, one, of, I think COVID will be a watershed moment for us from the perspective of understanding the power of the Africa unified voice, right? At the beginning of the crisis, uh, when every country thought ventilators was the thing to get, right? remember, the, remember then, and, mm -hmm. you know, countries were trying to get new, squeezed out of the market all the time. We couldn't get any ventilators, right? Same thing on vaccines at the beginning, right? We were trying to get vaccines, we were squeezed out of the market. Only when we came as a continent and sort of the AU under President Ramaphosa's leadership decided, let's figure out how many ventilators do we need, how many test kits do we need, how many, now how many vaccines, that's the work we've been doing, do we need? Then let's go and negotiate, you know, as a continent with a counterparty. Then we started to have a seat at the table, right? So I really think people have realized that there's a power in us, you know, coming together as one. It's been incredibly powerful through COVID. And I believe that this, now that we realize it, I hope, and I believe that it's gonna to come to, it, it'll, it'll stay, because that is what's gonna be needed to negotiate with some of these uh, partners. Mm -hmm. So I want a quick question on foreign aid, and then we'll talk about individuals and education to close up. How much should foreign aid be part of the discussion when it comes to the transformation of Africa? Should we look within first? I mean, I think it has been part of the discussion because, you know, yes, we, we can generate more domestically. We wrote a report on that, you know, the trillion dollar, hundred trillion dollar opportunity. Right? We think if you look at how much more we can generate from our own resources as a continent, there's a 50 trillion dollar additional on the revenue side, primarily tax revenues and not by changing, changing the uh, tax rates, but just by being more efficient in our tax authorities. There's another 50 billion dollars on the cost side that we can save because our governments are inherently, as we know, quite inefficient, right? So, so. But, but that's not gonna be enough, right? So we, we need to also have partners who are gonna work with us. 
Now, I think the reality is we relied too much on partners in the past. And, 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 and because, you know, everybody's fighting COVID, right? So everybody's struggling through this. And so a lot of the foreign partners are going to have to focus on the domestic market. So we're not going to get as much support from there. And so we need to even more so focus on, you know, generating our own resources, right? But I think it's going to have to be a combination of the two. Great. So let's close up and think about individuals, education and then individuals. So here, I'll, I'll kick off this one. Speaking of basic services, what's your view of the role of private sector institutions, for example, bridge in education and providing these services? More generally, how do you think about education in the continent? What can we do to um, help improve talent development in, across Africa? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, there's a lot we have to do. Like I said, you know, we have to find a way to educate, to educate our people. And, and we need to do it very, very different. We need to think very innovative, right? Because if it's a, you know, traditional, sorry, sorry, to, you know, traditional university, we just don't have enough, right? We just don't have, we have 6 million, uh, 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 50 million graduates of high school every year. And two, three years ago, there were only university slots for 6 million Africans. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what we have, right? So if it's about building the next Oxford brick and mortar, da, 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 it'll take us forever, right? So we need to think very creatively leveraging tech, right? Mm -hmm. And as you know, that's sort of what, we try to do with ALU and, uh, and ALX and some other innovative ways of thinking about it. But we need to think very, very creatively about how do you upskill people and, and what degrees do people need? Do they need a three year degree or is it an eight week training course, right? And please, right, again, we think vocational training, we think about half of the continent, you know, the, prior, the, the focus should be on vocational training, only about 8% of Africans go into vocational training today, right? So we need to rethink it very, very differently because and, and really focus it on education to employment. So that's, I think, so the traditional model has to be turned upside down. The good news again is with technology, we're seeing a number of players and primarily, you know, private sector players, you know, backed by some uh, philanthropic uh, institutions actually coming in and, and playing to that space. But this needs to be scaled up even more, much more. Great. You've often said, this is uh, from the audience, will it have mattered to Africa that I lived? Which wow. <laughs> led you to co-found the African Leadership Group. What do you believe the role of, I'm gonna edit the question was, individuals in Africa and driving the opportunities there. And, you know, as you close, you, what advice would you give to these amazing Africans that we have at Oxford and others who are watching about how yeah. as individuals, they can play a role in this African narrative? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think, but I think that's a great way to close. And as you know, I feel very strongly about, we have to look out for ourselves first. We're gonna get a lot of support and we get a lot of support but I think we had focused too much on this external support versus real what we can do as individuals to help the continent, right? And there's a lot we can do, right? Either through your, you know, either the, the, the institution where you're, where you're working at or even individually. But my push is always to say, what is, and it's easy for us to complain. It's easy to say, oh, the government is doing this. The government is not doing this, this person. But let's turn that around and say, what can I do to help, right? What role can I play? And that's been what Fred and I and a few others said, you know, there are a bunch of different issues there, but what can we do to help? And, you know, we're playing a bit of our role. Um, but I just encourage everybody to think through what can they do as individuals, right? And my other point is, I think also being bold, right? Especially people who are watching here, they're all, you know, we're all incredibly blessed, right? And so I always say, you know, sending three of your cousins to university, that's great, but everybody can do that, right? So as you think about what you can do for the continent, think much bolder, right? Think how do I help? you know, create, you know, I don't know, 100,000 jobs, right? How do I help, you know, uh, provide you know, electricity to 100 million people? You know, we have 600 million Africans who don't have electricity. So I just think those of us who were fortunate enough to have, you know, to have been lucky to, you know, have received and, 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 and uh, some goods and, you know, some, some uh, and be lucky, fortunate enough to, to be where we are today, I just encourage us to not just think about how we can play a role, but think about how we can be much bolder in what you want to do for the continent. Uh, that's an amazing way to stop. And, and actually, it, this has been an amazing time. And for my students, just you've had great speakers over the course of the last two days and today. Um, but consider, you know, Atre, who's joined us today, you know, went to university and did exceptionally well, probably had his choice of any job, um, has been at McKinsey for more than two decades. You know, I think it's probably fair to say McKinsey does more in Africa and McKinsey's African work and beyond Africa uh, is so much stronger because of you. And then you've used your platform at McKinsey to do other things like AL, you know, ALU and ALI or ALA and AM. Um, and, and so a systems leader. So because you, you've gone beyond the firm as it were to try to use the kind of authority and, and power and, and uh, 
and suasion that you have in order to change things. So for my students, exhibit A, this is what you could look like in 25 years. Um, and, uh, you know, Acha, I can't be grateful enough for all the support you've given to the school over the years and coming out on this Saturday to be with us. So thank you very much. No, thank you. And thank, by the way, thank you to you for, for your vision and your belief in Africa from the beginning, from the day we met. And for just executing, for me, this is exactly the kind of leader we want. We have a lot of leaders in Africa have vision, but it's always, you know, there's we, the where we, where we, you know, we, we fall short is on execution. So you said 10% and you delivered 12. So well done and thank you. Yeah. More work to be done for you and for me. But for today, thank you so much, Hachim. Thanks for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay,